Our reading comes to us from the ninth chapter of Matthew's gospel, beginning verse 35. Uh, we hear Jesus talk about the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts. No bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Our harvest scripture is what led me to think back to Trinity United Methodist Church in Lincoln and their beautiful harvest stained glass window. The picture of Jesus at the edge of the wheat field carrying a sheaf of wheat in his arms. This passage um, holds special memories for me because uh, it's always taking me back to that window. And for many years, I worshiped there with my grandparents when we went visiting in Lincoln. And then that turned out to be my college church where I worked two years as a student intern for youth ministry. Of course, August 1st, 1987, it is in Trinity Church where Lori and I exchanged our wedding vows. So there's very important memories in that church, just as I know people have created many important memories in the Rosedale and the Donovan churches. But let's take a look at this scripture that inspired that stained glass window and also inspired quite a few people uh, to join Jesus as a laborer in his harvest. So we'll talk about the condition of being harassed and helpless that, that the people felt when Matthew was writing, they were like a sheep without a shepherd. We'll look at how Jesus indeed saw this, this harvest as plentiful and how he uh, decided upon laborers. So what put the people in their harassed and helpless condition? Well, let's remember they were all Jewish but they were not all considered clean, uh, not clean by the standards of, say, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. By and large, the people of, of Judah and Israel were honest, hardworking people, but they did not come up to all the standards that the Pharisees uh, had set. It, it was causing them to lose track that all the people share the same ancestry. At one time, they were all slaves in Egypt. 
and that it was thanks to God calling Moses to lead them out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. But what happened just two centuries after the days of Moses, the Israelites were turning to Samuel the prophet and, and saying, Samuel, we want a king. We want a king like all the neighboring countries. We want to keep up with them. And Samuel is saying, but wait a minute. Are you sure you want to do that? Kings are not perfect, you know. And Samuel turned to God in prayer and said, God, they want a king. And God said, well, if they really want one, but Samuel, you've got to tell them that if they get a king different from the king of the universe, if they get a king different from me, that king will act like any other, uh, any other earthly king. They will want their sons to come into his army. That king is going to have your daughters come and work at the palace and, and tend the gardens, tend the fields. If they get a king, the king will act like one. Yet the people begged, give us a king. So Samuel gave them the reminder saying, look, God says, this king's going to call your sons and daughters away from their homes to work for the king. But they said, oh, we want a king. So what was they were given? A king. And the very first one, Saul, uh, he was a good leader at first, but as time went by and as he aged and as his mental skill failed him, uh, he went from being a good king to becoming a troubled king, uh, a bad king, as it were. And so it is that that is the nature of, of the way things went in history over time. They might have one good king followed by five or six bad kings. We saw that in our Bible study on Jeremiah. Uh, the, the ratio of good to bad kings was not in the favor of the good side. So as we move forward to Jesus' century, the people were harassed and helpless because Israel had been through many bad kings. But also Matthew talks about how they were like sheep without a shepherd. Who was their spiritual leader? If, if the Pharisees were setting the standards so, so very, very high, uh, if the Sadducees were looking down their noses upon the average descendant of, of Abraham, um, they, they were without shepherds because the shepherds were not showing interest in them. The shepherds were not caring. And as far as kings went, they didn't have a good king on the throne. They had a son of King Herod a son of Herod the Great. And we remember Herod the Great was the one that persecuted the infants way back when Jesus was born. Uh, the, the sons of King Herod did not fall very far away from that tree. And so they did not have good leadership from their king. They did not have interested leadership from the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, this explains why they felt uh, harassed and helpless why they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so it is that Jesus is seeing that as a plentiful harvest. Here are all these children of Israel who need calling back to God. These children of Israel, they need to know that they, that they are loved and that they are cared about. And uh, so, so it is that uh, Jesus is turning to them who are left out by the attitudes of others and giving them the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And I want to talk about that play on words. It was by the attitudes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that so many people of God were being left out of the life of the synagogue and the temple. This is why Jesus, to take on those attitudes, gave the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus is uh, calling out to these people, calling them back home and saying, you've got leadership. This is why he turns to the 12 disciples and authorizes them to cast out demons and to heal the sick and to go out there. Just like Moses authorized uh, leaders among the people to help Moses do all the work. 
Jesus, like the new Moses of the New Testament, he's also authorizing new leadership to get out there and reach the people. So for us in our time, uh, uh, these words harassed and helpless, I think they ring a lot of bells uh, because we, we, do, we do take note that there are a lot of folks feeling pretty harassed at this time. We also have that sense of helplessness when we look at the headlines and we wonder what next, uh, how in the world can we straighten everything out. Something that I want to say though is, uh, unlike the people in Matthew chapter 9 who are harassed and helpless and without a good shepherd, I just want to make it very clear, we are not without a good shepherd. Our good shepherd never went anywhere. Um, Check it again, but in Psalm chapter 23, the good shepherd is still there. It still says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Double check the Gospel of John chapter 10. Jesus is still saying, I am the good shepherd. Our good shepherd has not gone anywhere. Our good shepherd is with us. We double check too. Our good shepherd is alive, very much alive. The cross did not take him from us. Oh no. Again, check Matthew chapter 28. Yes, Jesus gets out of the tomb. The end of Mark chapter 16, sure enough, Jesus is resurrected. And Luke chapter 24, the end of that gospel, it's not the end of Jesus. The tomb is empty. He's out walking and teaching. And of course, John chapter 20. Sure enough, Mary Magdalene does not find Jesus in the tomb. Instead, Jesus finds her and says, Mary, stop your weeping. Our good shepherd didn't go anywhere. What we need to keep track of is when life throws up its harassments, when we begin to get frustrated and feel uh, helpless, our good shepherd has not gone anywhere. Jesus Christ is still the Jesus Christ of the scripture. Jesus Christ is still the Jesus Christ of the Holy Spirit that wants to be dwelling in us and filling our hearts. Uh, we are not completely helpless. Uh, we have our good shepherd. The important thing is um, to not lose track of our good shepherd. We are to be the spiritual sheep of his pasture. Let's not be like horses, as it is said. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. We are human beings. We are also the sheep of Jesus' pasture. Jesus is leading us to the green pastures. He's leading us to the still waters. It is up to us, though, to, to take and eat. It is up to us to take and drink. Uh, he is still providing for us. He is still our good shepherd. It is important. It is up to us to be accepting the green pastures be accepting the still waters as our spiritual food and drink. Amen.